Ollie. Hey. How are you? How are you? Fantastic. Fantastic. How about you? Great. Everything's going good. Bizarre every day. Yeah, I know what you mean. I know what you mean. It's just, uh, it's kind of crazy every day for, well, it's, it's always like that. It's not, this is ain't nothing new. That's true. Just add a few pandemic uh, stories here and there. People flipping out. Now people are flipping out about getting the vaccine. Oh, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we had a little bit of a, a weird thing that happened with us this week. Um, and I've had a few of my staff have not been too tickled about getting an, a, a vaccine. So, and I get it, I, you know, they're a little scared about it, but one of my staff um, has some autoimmune disorder situations and she's been concerned about which vaccine. So she finally decided she was going to go ahead and get the Moderna vaccine. And our pharmacist came by and vaxxed us and um, she did hers a little bit late because he, he couldn't get Moderna right off the bat. And so Finally got it for her, and yesterday was her day to go back in and get her her second injection. Well, she had also to go to a funeral for her husband's uncle or something like that, and they were going to be going over there, so she was going to just whip by the pharmacy and get the je- injection done there and then head on over. And pharmacist does the injection and then has this funny look on his face, and she can't figure out why. And he said, I'll be back in a second, comes back inside, and she, as she's sitting there, the vial's on the counter, Instead, he gave her the Pfizer injection instead of the Moderna injection. And, and I mean, I haven't seen, and I looked around through the literature, I haven't seen anything where this is a problem. It just might mean that she has to have, you know, a second injection as far as I can tell. In fact, uh, he even said that there's a couple okay. of sites in Atlanta who are doing cross uh, vaccinations because they think it's got better coverage. I don't know if that's true or not, but still, she she freaked out. And I totally, I get it, you know, I mean, and I just told him, I said, look, hey, you know, this is one of the problems with being healthcare professionals is we make mistakes and we're still humans. And, you know, just give her some time. I'm, I'm surprised he had the uh, freezer to freeze the Pfizer because the only places we're finding Pfizer, Susan and I got it, was at Northside Hospital, you know, because they've got those freezers that go to a thousand below zero or whatever. Yeah, well, we, that was I how I had how Pfizer. He, so, yeah, so I mean, it was it worked out pretty well for that part. Thing is, when people get one, and they ask you what you're getting. There are those people that say, and I, I've been screwing around with people, as you can imagine. I'm saying, oh wow, you got Moderna, Pfizer is much, <laughs> <laughs> and then they start doing all this research and they find stuff wrong with. You know, you can find stuff wrong with both of them. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I mean, the one that gets me, though, I mean, and this J&J one that just came out, if they can make it more effective, it would actually be huge because it's a one-shot deal, but it, the results are lower. That's the problem. So, right. um, anyway. Hey, uh, how's everything else going with you guys? Good, man. Natalie's engaged. I don't know if I told you that. No, congratulations. Thank you. And uh, she's getting married June 10th with eight of us there at the wedding in Charleston. So he's a great guy, Citadel boy. He's an occupational therapist also. And we really love the guy. So I never thought I'd say that someone dating my daughter, but. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand. So that's, really, that's the only news other than. What are we doing this weekend, Susan? Oh, nothing. (laughs) Well, there's always bourbon, you know, so. Yeah, there's been a lot of that, too much. So I, two weeks ago, week and a half ago, I said, Paul, this is, I looked at my stomach and said, this is ridiculous. And I've had a foot issue, so I can't walk. And so I'm just eating a lot less and it's going fine. I'm not that hungry. And I'm, it's, it's a lot of it's mental. You don't, oh, yeah. keep, you look great. Are you still Thanks. running? Yeah, I actually, it was planning on riding my bike this morning, but with the rain that came in overnight, the road was too wet. So I got up and ran instead, but I just hired a fitness coach, oh, um, wow. a virtual fitness coach. And she lives in Franklin, Tennessee. And we do a one-to-one meeting once a month. And then she's got an app that she gives me all this information on. I got the um, diet her name, and everything. Not so much diet. I mean, she says she said that we we'll get into that if we need to. Um, but she said right now, I don't think that's really as much of your issue. It seems like, 
although I think it probably could be, you know, I'm, I definitely could stand not to eat nearly as much sugar and, you know, hit this stuff right over here as much as I do. But, um, you know, the, for the most part, it's really just making sure I, I need some variety in my workouts to keep me interested in it. And I'll get really bored mm-hmm. quick if I don't, because I'm just right. so ADD and I can just, there's a squirrel, I'm going to go chase it for a little bit, you know? So I need something like that to yeah, keep me on track. Stop doing it. Then yeah. Stop doing it. So I just want to quickly go over a few things that uh, just to review what we're going to talk about a little bit today. Uh, we we want I want to talk about um, again how the whole um, VEF Omni thing got started because I think that's a fascinating story. I want to spend okay. some time talking about your experience with Seco and how you got into being the general CE chair and what that means. Some interesting stories about Seco perhaps. And, um, and we'll sort of just also talk about, um, one of the other thing is the connection between Omni and Seco at the very early stages, how the Southern council and you guys were in the same, you know, trailer and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And, uh, and the, the last thing is how that has affected your philosophy on how things go with, Involvement with legislation, why optometrists should be involved in things. I think that would be a, a good way to go. And we'll also end up going way off topic somewhere, which will be brilliant and it'll be a lot of fun. So that'll be the cool. best part. Welcome to the Vision of Leadership podcast. I'm your host, Ted McElroy. This podcast is dedicated to helping you find your wins have a better quality of life, and become the best leader you can be. Hey, have you subscribed to this podcast yet? Don't miss an episode. They're worth every single thing you paid for them, which is nothing because they're free. I invite you to subscribe to the podcast by hitting the subscribe button. Give us a rating and a review on your specific podcast player. This helps us with our podcast rankings and makes it easier for people to find us. And as always, please support those who help support us. Episode 102 of this podcast, Chris interviewed Justin Kwan, Michelle Andrews, and Richard Ruth. They pointed out that as a profession, we have done a great job of letting our patients know that myopia is not a big deal. If you can see 2020, there is no worry. It is the high myopes that are more danger. And as they said, that message is tragic. Any myopia has a higher risk of maculopathy, glaucoma, and earlier cataract development. In the MySight One Day clinical trials, only 4% of study participants who got ProClear One Days stayed stable in their myopia progression over the three-year period. That means you can confidently say, parent, by not going to a system geared to slow the myopia progression, there is a 96% chance your child's vision will get worse. This may take away some of the choice your child has in the future as to how they will correct their vision. Choice not fear of the disease associations with myopia is what best resonates with parents when it comes to myopia control for their children. And with Cooper Vision's MySight One Day, we now have an FDA-approved single-use contact lens to lessen the progression of myopia in our patients. Contact your Cooper Vision representative to find out more about MySight One Day contact lenses. Welcome to the Vision of Leadership podcast. I'm your host, Ted McElroy, and I have today a very special guest with me, Dr. Paula Jamian. Uh, Paul has not only been a great friend of mine, but also a very good mentor of mine for many years, including a a three-month stint, which I refer to as the hardest three months of my entire life as an extern for Paul. But the amount of things that I learned there and what it became and how it shaped me as an optometrist is just amazing. And I know the story is being told over and over and over again. But before I get him to say anything, I want to give you a couple little things I know about Paul, but also just so in just case you don't know who he is, and I can't imagine who you are if you don't, but um, he is the center director for the Omni Eye Services in Atlanta and started that position in 1984. In 1995, 
He was named the SECO OD of the South, and in 2000, he became the GOA president, the Georgia Optometric Association president, which actually to this day still remains the longest term as a president without having an election to be put into another term of any president we've had at GOA. Uh, he preceded me by about four or five years. Um, he was named in 2000 also one of the 10 optometrists of the decade by optom- optometric management. He is the SECO general chair or CE chair. He's a founding board member for the American Board of Optometry and the Optometri- Optometric Glaucoma Society. Uh, but more importantly, he has been acc- uh, given the accolade of the um, National Optometric Found, uh, Society uh, Hall of Fame. And I was actually there when he was given that uh, presentation in 2015 in Seattle. And it was a really nice experience for me. And I can't imagine what it must have felt like for you, Paul. And uh, so, Paul, welcome to our uh, podcast today. Thanks for being here with me. Ted, thank you so much. And then, as now, having you there in the audience in 2015 and uh, being able to talk with you today is indeed a pleasure. And thank you so much for uh, doing this podcast series. It shows, uh, it reflects on you as an innovator and a leader as you continue to be and the use of technology. This is actually, of all the speaking I've done, I think the first podcast I've ever done. So wow. I feel a little bit behind the times. But thank you for uh, pulling me into the 21st century or whatever century we're in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been an interesting thing for me. I've, I've, I've done probably about 10 or 15 of these, I guess. Chris Wolf has done the lion's share of them for us, but it's been a lot of fun. And it seems like everything else, just like the first time you ever did a foreign body or something like that, it was like really shaky and weird. And after you get a few of them in your belt, you kind of feel pretty good about it. I've actually learned how to do engineering of actually putting these podcasts together. It takes me now only about 30 minutes to put it together at the end after, you know, an hour and a half that first time. So those kind of things are really neat, but uh, I, I, I'll, I will give you one little, um, uh, I guess, uh, confession. I, this is, I've looked forward to this particular podcast interview more than most anyone I've ever done. And I've also been more nervous about this one than more than I've ever done primarily just because it's someone I know so well and I respect so much. And uh, you mean so much to me, Paul. And I, again, thank you for being here. And uh, so I want to start off asking you a question, like where did you grow up? Uh, exactly. Where did you grow up in the New England area? Um, you know, I, I'm lucky to have two lives, geographic lives. I grew up uh, outside of Boston and went to school at University of Vermont and got used to the snow and zero degrees and shoveling and hitting the locks with the icer just to get into the car. And then uh, my last year of optometry school got um, uh, chosen, which was a, a real turning point in my career, to go to Baskin Palmer. I didn't even know really what the South was. I thought the South was Connecticut or uh, maybe Delaware, but uh, had the chance to, to go to Miami and train there. That led to the position in Atlanta, but still have family in Boston you know, love visiting, but uh, not necessarily enamored with the weather. And um, there's a certain New England feel that you don't get anywhere else, just like um, anybody who's left their home and goes back. So uh, I have some fond memories up there. So how did you, that's something else. How did you um, end up at Baskin Palmer in the first, how did you find it? Was that a new program? Was it something, how, how did that all work out? So, very interesting question because I just made a call about uh, six months ago. You know, as you get older, you you want to thank the people in your lives that meant so much that you maybe forgot to thank along the way. And his name was David, is David Greenberg. He's um, in the Midwest, and he was on the faculty at Illinois after he left as one of the deans at NECO. And David had forged all these amazing relationships with MDs in the Boston area and beyond. And one of his uh, relationships led to him uh, meeting a physician, an ophthalmologist at Baskin Palmer, which led to him 
setting up this rotation. And I'll never forget, Ted, when he stood in front of the class and he was going through this new, and it was going to be a six-month rather than a three-month rotation. And he talked about um, people needing to apply. Uh, I got kind of these butterflies in my stomach thinking, how can an optometrist go to an ophthalmology institute? I mean, all our lectures back back then were given by ophthalmologists, not optometrists. We didn't know much about disease. This was the 76 to 1980 period. But anyway, I had lived at home in optometry school, so I was a good boy and got good grades and didn't go to the ground round and have three pitchers of beer after each class like some of my classmates did. And so the grades were good enough to consider me, and I was selected. And uh, I called David to thank him for really changing the history of optometry, not through me, but through the many people that have uh, been at Baskin Palmer since because of his groundbreaking you know, phone call to establish that externship. What what were some of the the biggest shaping factors in who you became because of being at Baskin Palmer? Well, you know, I always believed in optometry and and optometry's roots, and so if it wasn't Baskin Palmer, I think I'd be uh, part of COVD right now because I almost did a vision therapy uh, program at SUNY between my third and fourth year, and I was accepted into part of that, but not the clinical part. I said, well, that's the part I want. So I applied for the Baskin Palmer thing. And David called me that one day I was in my parents' basement, which is where I was living. And he said, I've got good news and bad news. Good news, you're going to Baskin Palmer. Bad news, we're giving you your last choice for the summer rotation, which was this little rehab hospital in Western Mass. But Use that as practice for Baskin Palmer. And when I got there, you know, just scared to death, I would hide in the in the visual field rooms, then Goldman, you know, manual perimetry rooms with some of the techs, got to know them really well because I was just, I felt like a fish out of water. I said, what am I doing here? But I was the second uh, student in all fairness, a classmate named Steve Graham, who went on. Uh, to become a medical doctor, very, very smart, but always maintained his loyalty to optometry. He was the first and really did the lion's share of the, this is who we are and this is what we can do. And, uh, you know, we slowly proved ourselves over time and that program became um, very well established and Brian Dembesti took my place as director after we established a residency, and I did that residency. And then Mark Dunbar to this day is still there and training, you know, an incredible uh, number of bright people, many of whom are all, all on the speaking circuit. We use a lot of them uh, as SECO speakers. And I know we'll talk about SECO in a little bit. Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, you know, with so you're at Baskin Palmer, you've done your residency, you know, you're, you're come to the end of that program. So now what, where, where do you go from there? It was, that was again, one of those scary moments, you know, it was kicking the can to be at Baskin Palmer for two and a half years and I loved it. But at the end of it, I said, now what? Well, you know, God is good. And, um, we got a call, the three of us, the three of the four, uh, residents, that there was this center starting in Atlanta, a referral center, a diagnostic center. We really weren't sure what it was because the name kept changing and that they were looking for an optometrist with some disease experience and that they had brought a few down from Southern College of Optometry, but that didn't work out. And so uh, Steve Graham, who I mentioned, the first OD at Baskin Palmer was uh, looking at medical school, so he wasn't interested. And then Bill Wallace, my partner in crime down there, was really anxious to leave Miami, and I wasn't. So we kind of set up a deal where, Bill, why don't you go to Atlanta, wherever the heck that is. Again, it was in the South, and I hadn't even heard of it, and see how it goes. And if the coast is clear and it's a decent opportunity, I'll come up in six months. And he kept in touch with me, and that's exactly what happened. And uh, 
what I'm talking about specifically is the Vision Education Foundation, which was a foundation that was a spinoff of the Southern College of Optometry in order to hide some alumni money in case SCO, at the time this was a possibility, merged with the UT system. And they would have lost all that into the general fund and not had control over it. So they formed this foundation. They appointed a president, a former clinic director, with no real purpose. And that's when one of the many heroes of my life, uh, an optometrist named Bill Cuthbertson up in Cornelia, Georgia, who you knew well, uh, Bill just kept harping on, why don't we start a clinic? Why don't we start a clinic that allows optometrists to send their patients and not get bad mouthed and the patients aren't stolen and the families aren't stolen and and we've got to start a clinic and it's got to be run by optometrists and we'll tell the ophthalmologist what to do. And that was his simple idea. And he just kept persisting. He was on the board at SCO at the time. So he said, let's use this VEF. What, what is this thing? It's not doing anything. And he convinced them to buy a plot of land with this, what looked like a double wide trailer uh, by Shalford Hospital and in Dunwoody here in Atlanta, and uh, the VEF was born. He brought some temporary clinic uh, instructors, faculty members down. Uh, again, none of them were really ready to handle the controversy because it was controversial. The Atlanta ODs really didn't believe that we weren't going to do the same things to them that ophthalmology had been doing for years. And so when Bill came up, he, he had the um, the forcefulness and the charisma and definitely the clinical knowledge, one of the smartest people I've ever met, to get the thing going. And then I came up as the education director of the VEF Educational and Diagnostics Center. And it had to be called that, Ted, because you know, we had no therapeutics. We had barely gotten diagnostics when the thing kicked off. So... That was the the start of the referral center system. So how did how does an optometrist operate in a in an environment like that? I mean, I, I mean, I can still remember you telling stories when I was there about you know how all the drugs were locked up in a cabinet and the ophthalmologist had the keys to it and things like that. Correct. It was um, it was rough. Uh, diagnostics again had just passed here in Georgia. They were locked up my entire four years of optometry school, which is so ironic because now we can use them. And unfortunately, at times we're getting away from using them and talking people into doing testing that allows us to bypass dilation. But back then, we were just dying to dilate without asking an ophthalmologist permission. And then Bill and I, when we started seeing our two or three or four patients a day, had a part-time ophthalmologist, again, one of my heroes, Bob Lennon, who had no ego. He just wanted to do the right things by patients. He really wasn't that interested in practicing seeing patients all day, every day, but he'd come up two half days a week and kind of cover us as we were putting optic neuritis patients on oral steroids and, you know, sneaking uh, antibiotics into tear bottles and just trying to stay as safe as we could in an environment where there were we had just passed diagnostics but absolutely nothing in the therapeutic realm. So it was rough. It was touch and go and uh but Bob would come up and support us and then we finally uh, got a full time our first full time ophthalmologist, Dr. Ralph Diorio, one of my not only heroes but superheroes. And he came on in 1983 with the belief that optometrists should do absolutely everything that they feel like they want to do if they're trained to do it. And he supported us in, in everything we did, not only the clinical endeavor that we were starting out with, namely seeing patients and returning them, but also the educational aspect starting to lecture and, and do seminars and workshops on ocular disease and pharmacology and foreign body removal and Goldman tonometry. And back then those were groundbreaking things. We just weren't, uh, you know, we weren't used to doing them. And so 
uh, with the support slowly of a lot of amazing optometrists in this area and in the surrounding states, Ted, because, you know, nobody had a friendly place to send. So they would send from Greenville, South Carolina or Chattanooga, Tennessee or um, eastern Alabama. We got that, that's how I made so many amazing friends uh, that I keep in touch with to this day, because a lot of them sent to us um, back then. So to your knowledge, was there another system or program like this anywhere else in the country or were you guys the first would you say or you know later we heard that martin and tate in north carolina uh in um southern pines really were they were sort of doing the same thing maybe at the same time or just a little bit after us uh as far as and they just, they liked working with optometrists and they got it early on. And I'm sure there were practices around the country where there were friendships that allowed the two uh, groups to work together. But as far as anything formal and, and set in a pure, what I call a pure co-management or referral environment where we weren't doing any dispensing, no optical, no prescriptions, no contact lens fitting, no routine care. I believe we were the first, um, at least I claim that we were the first, whether that's true or not. I don't know. One of these days, someone's going to, you know, run up to me and prove that that's not true. But it was all starting around then. And it caught on very quickly because, to your point, we then brought in very talented people that not only trained at Baskin Palmer, but at VA hospitals and residency programs, which again were really rare back then. And Dr. Daryl Mann trained with me and he opened Omni of Chattanooga. And Dr. Howell Finley, who trained with me at Baskin Palmer, came and spent six months with us and then opened Omni of Lexington. And Chris Quinn, Omni of New Jersey, et cetera, et cetera. We opened 14 of them around the country by about 1985 or six. And I really feel like <clears throat> all of those amazing doctors, most of whom are still in practice, uh, really changed the face of how optometry and ophthalmology work together. Yeah, actually, I believe it was Chris Quinn that hanged the moniker on you of being the father of optometric co-management. And, you know, that was the thing that really kind of stuck out a lot to me when I was at Omni doing my externship while my hands weren't sweating, you know, worried that I was going to get yelled at or something like that. But, <laughs> um, it was just the fact that we were, we were being empowered to do things. And it was people just like Dr. Diorio that you mentioned that were making us feel like we could truly do that. And, um, having, having those people in front of us really was a, a, a life altering experience. I don't know another way to say it. It, it really, um, we, we had a sense of urgency because we knew what ophthalmologists thought of us. And at the time, the drug bills were starting to kick in, as you know, because you were a part of a lot of them. And in 1987, the first antibiotic bill was uh, being introduced in Georgia. And I was sitting across from people, ophthalmologists, uh, Emory faculty, that were talking about us like we were you know, like we had a third grade education. We had no clinical experience and they had 10,000 hours every week. And we had one hour of pharmacology and they had, you know, 40 semesters. And it just went on and on to the point where it kind of sensitized me and shaped me a little bit as an instructor. Apologies to you and all my <laughs> former students that there's a, that we had this urgency to be as good, if not better than them, we we just couldn't take it for granted that we just go through our four years and we don't know our stuff. We had to prove ourselves because they were they were on a mission to keep us down, and so we, we did prove ourselves. and And these referral centers acted as training grounds, and then the VAs came into play, and a lot of really amazing people got incredible training. And then the schools all went to the model of fourth year, almost complete externships, which helped a lot rather than being at the school clinic and seeing, you know, one patient every three hours. 
And so I've always had this sense of urgency that my my students and to our audience, you were an excellent one, Ted. Um, I you really were a couple of times. <laughs> well, <laughs> we all make mistakes, True. and I made plenty in my teaching style, and for that I apologize. No, but no. seriously, the um, the the urgency with which we all felt we needed to progress and catch up and and go from a a point where when I was in optometry school this amazing lecturer came down from ICO Paul Schulman and gave a cataract lecture and I just assumed he was an ophthalmologist and guess what he was an OD and then you know Jimmy Bartlett and Lou Catania and Larry Alexander and those pioneers kind of paved the way for Bill and I to start lecturing. And you remember these, uh, speaking of diagnostics, these 100-hour diagnostic certification classes that we held in the little classroom at the end of our double wide at the VEF, and the other end was the Southern Council. Uh, And I know we'll get to that. But um, 100 hours on diagnostic drugs. Imagine setting out that curriculum. So this weekend, for example, might be eight hours on cycloplegics and eight hours on topical anesthesia. And we just, we really had to drag it out. And we had faculty from IU come down. And, but, you know, there were 50 people at that first course, and a lot of them were older and just starving to progress and adopt the new model of optometry. And it's just so fun to look back and think about where we were and and how quickly we came through kind of the dark ages. But how, how big of an uphill climb was it not outside of our profession, inside our profession to get people to understand how important this was? Well, you know, you look at uh, the Dean way back then at UAB thought we should remain a drugless profession. Uh, A lot of ODs, that when we started the referral center said that's not going to work and they were against it. Um, You know, we've always sort of fought from within and Dr. Tom Griffith, your close friend of mine at SECO reminds us of the days when John Casto, who was elected into the hall of fame a few years ago and just an amazing man, past president of SECO would go around and, kind of espouse the West Virginia model of therapeutics because they got their therapy bill, what, in the 70s, 76, yeah, I 1976. think. 1976. Right. And, and that AOA fought him and said, you're going to do more harm than good. You need to be quiet about these therapeutic things. And so we've always kind of uh, battled ourselves. But when I look at my timeline that God dropped me into this profession from 80 to 2020, uh, we've come such a long way. And I think we just need to focus on using what we have, uh, taking advantage of what we've gained and not slip backwards. And in some cases, I see that by People just outright saying, I don't want to treat glaucoma. Everybody goes blind from it. Or I don't want to do dry eye. It's annoying. Or I don't want to do this or that. We're we're giving up the things that took so long, uh, so much work, so much money, so many hours to gain. And uh, so I just, I'm going to spend my last few years in this profession, however long I'm given, just talking about you know, let's not right at the moment. I mean, there's nothing wrong with trying to get something else. Arkansas just solidified their laser bill and the three or four other states that have surgery bills. That's wonderful. But I get students asking me, Ted, well, I want to come to Georgia, but you don't have lasers. When are you going to get lasers? And it's sort of like, uh, when are you going to get lasers? And when are you going to use the things that we have had. I mean, we've had glaucoma in the state since 1993. And I don't want to go on record with any meaningful statistic, but it's a way lower percentage of people that in our profession that treat glaucoma than should. So we just need to um, embrace 
and, and look back at the, the great things that we achieved, understand how we achieved them, that we need to continue to stay involved legislatively so that we can keep them. And then if we can go forward from there, that's great. But that's going to be the battle for this new generation. So this connection, we, we mentioned a couple times already with um, the VEF, which later became the Omni system, and with the Southern Council of Optometry, which later became known as SECO and still is Southern Council. Um, this connection, and you, you actually had the title already of, of education director. So you've had this title on and off for many years. But that kind of really became solidified in the 90s, I believe. Is that correct? And how did that sort of come about? Well, it's that's a great question because, again, I smile and think back to um, another one of my superheroes, Dr. Frank Gibson, who practiced in Thomaston, Georgia, about an hour and a half, maybe two hours south of Atlanta, who whenever he wanted to send a patient, he would say, this is where I'm sending you to this VEF center. And they'd say, Atlanta, we don't drive in Atlanta. And he'd say, well, then, and he'd shove the phone book at him and say, then you pick out somebody, but that's where I want you to go. Well, Frank was the editor of the Southern Journal of Optometry, which was a quarterly journal that started publishing disease case reports. Again, something unheard of at the time. We take it for granted now. And the Southern Council leased space from the VEF in about maybe a quarter of that double wide trailer at the end. And that was their office. So Frank would come down to Bill and I and say, Phils, I need an article next month. <laughs> and so we'd say, yes, sir. We got to know Frank. We got to know the Southern Council. And we both became volunteers. And I was a volunteer when it was held, I believe, at the at the Radisson, and you'd walk into a, a classroom, Ted, and as past president of SECO, you can, you can really appreciate this. And uh, bottom line is that you'd open the door and all the smoke would come out. There'd be <laughs> ashtrays at every place. Um, it was just a really interesting time. And I'm not sure I knew what I was getting into to answer your question. I, I knew this was a special organization. Uh, I'm not sure I knew how big it would become, but I stayed on the committee and I was uh, a committee member under Dr. Jim Prince from Virginia and then Kathy Amos and Dr. Kirk Smick. And then um, Kirk moved over to an AOA role and a couple of people looked at me and said, you're the chair now, and I've been chair since 2002, and it's been truly one of the most amazing blessings in my life as a kind of a side road or side show to my practice, but it really is much more than that. It's It's been a central theme throughout is working with the incredible people that we've both been able to work with, the officers, the committee and uh, putting together a you know, unique program every year, and including this year when I hope we'll be the groundbreaker and be the first meeting to get back to it when we meet in late April. So SECO uh, has really pushed the envelope, and that tied in with the therapeutics because, you know, educate and then legislate, and that's the way optometry has always done it. We didn't go down to the Capitol and say, well, pass this bill and, you know, we'll take a weekend course. No, it was, this is what we do. This is how we're trained. And you need to provide better access to your citizens and allow us to do these things. Yeah. And I can remember a couple of things that how they both tied in together. I mean, first of all, SECO typically happens right in the middle of our general assembly here in Georgia. And I can remember many times having you tap me on the shoulder and say, Hey, Ted, the whole bunch of us are heading down to the Capitol. We got a bill we need to go talk about today. So we're all heading down. And so we'd all just leave. Um, but on top of that, just some of the crazy things now, it seems crazy that happened at SECO that wasn't happening anywhere else, a foreign body course being taught in a state where they tried to shut us down for having this right. kind of class being done and exactly. the innovative things that have been done at SECO over the years in education that are now being, you know, they say, um, you know, 
copying is the sincerest form of flattery, but you see a lot of the things that started at SECO popping up in other people's meetings, which I'm a firm believer in, in the, the law of abundance. Uh, there's enough to go around for everybody. And I think that having someone to be a groundbreaking place to do things like that have really improved education across optometry in general. Well, we've had some, uh, like you say, some amazing leaders that have pushed the envelope. And whether it is uh, nowadays laser workshops and injection workshops or back then, taking out foreign bodies with magnets and chewing gum. <laughs> we, we did it all. <laughs> and uh, it's, um, it's been an incredible, incredible part of, of my career that's sort of blended in with it. We've done SECO workshops at Omni. I've used, you know, Omni residents to start their speaking careers at SECO. We really believe... Um, because you were a big part of pushing this when you were president and going up the chairs, uh, you know, representing the profession with the faculty that, that we put in front of the public eye. And, and that involves getting more women and minorities involved with uh, speaking, giving them a chance. And so a lot of people think of SECO as, Oh, I won't be able to speak at SECO until, you know, I'm an accomplished speaker after 30 years. Well, no, if you look at the last 10 or 15 years, we've started a bunch of careers, speaking careers at SECO by giving them an opportunity, taking a chance that they'd be really bad, but they almost never were. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm really proud of that because right now, as you well know, Ted, I mean, we really don't need ophthalmologists at our meeting. We've got such smart people people in our own profession from systemic disease to pharmacology to, to eye disease. Um, in the old days, that was all ophthalmology. Now, we complement with some surgeons that obviously have tremendous skills in those areas that we don't. And they're really honored to speak at SECO, and they, they know... Um, they basically know what that means. And as you also mentioned, that has pushed, you know, Academy and AOA and Vision Expo, and you see them copying some things that we've done, which, which is a form of flattery. And, um, you know, we'll continue to try to do that. One of the other things that I've seen happen with you is SECO has become an incredible creative outlet for you. Um, talk a minute about what you feel like is one of the most creative things that you did at SECO. Well, you know, back when we didn't have COPE, uh, where the guidelines have gotten, I would call maybe too stringent, uh, bordering on ridiculous, uh, when we could have a little bit of fun mixed in because after all, you know, who actually gets, 50 full minutes of CE and their mind isn't wandering and they're not checking their phone. And, but back before all that, you know, timing the bathroom breaks and the crazy stuff, we did this thing called Seco live and we'd have dateline Seco where I came out. Well, the most outrageous thing was I came out dressed instead of Paula Jamie and as, as Paula Janey uh, trying to mimic Jane Pauly. And I mean, I remember my wife, Susan, daughter, Natalie took me to this used clothing store and we're trying on pantyhose and skirts and scarves. And, uh, to this day, I enjoy doing that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but, um, came out on stage and it took people a while to understand who I was, but, and then we had, um, kind of the Jay Leno stand-up thing, and I had a band, which was the I Docs of Rock, Bad Habits, and they'd sing songs behind me, like uh, instead of My Sharona, My Scotoma, and Foreigners Double Vision, and we just had so much fun incorporating uh, highlights of education into these news shows or evening talk shows. Um, one of the best, uh, I'm sure you remember it was a guy named Derwood Fincher, Mr. Double Talk. Yep. And he says things that sound like 
English and sound like they're making sense and sound like you should understand them, but you don't because he's tripping over his words and saying, yeah, and as far as the residency is concerned, you know, optometric residencies are, you know, they're good for residencies and the program for the, and you think you're the stupid one if you don't understand them. Well, he got up and did an address. We titled him uh, at the time, President uh, Bush, W. Bush, uh, his economic advisor, and he stood up and did the talk on Medicare. I think it took about six minutes before people realized it was a total goof. So we've always been able to do fun things, even recently. I mean, we did a an experience at the Porsche Center this past SECO 2020 that we just, as you well know more than anyone, just barely yeah, got in know. before the, the corona. And uh, we you know, did an hour on malpractice in this really cool room overlooking the Porsche test track here in Atlanta. And then we all went around and had a professional driver spin us around the course. And so we, we do, you know, dinner events and tours and we, we did a ghost tour in New Orleans a couple of years ago. And it really is that, that creative side, as you mentioned, uh, I don't, consider myself that creative, but we're always trying to think of new things to do. And I've got an incredible committee always have that is a big part of that. And, uh, don't sell yourself short, Paul. I mean, you're, it's very creative watching what you're doing and getting to see it from a, a bunch of different sides has been amazing. Not just from the, but now actually being part of your committee and the planning side of things with the, with the business education side of it has been just a blast. And, uh, I, I think you're, I you're very creative. That. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we're all, you know, it's, it's optometry has been this amazing family to me and we've done a ton of things together. And I look back at that greatest generation, speaking of referrals and the doctors that laid the groundwork for, you know, doing new diagnostic procedures. I mean, think about visual fields. We, I mentioned the the manual Goldman perimetry, that's all we had. And when automated perimetry came out, I'll never forget people in Atlanta like Dr. Elton Justice or Ralph Rogers or Tom Jackson, Bernie Kahn would call and say, Paul, I just bought this thing. I don't know what it does. Could you come over and help me with it? And they wanted to learn and they wanted to treat and they wanted to dilate and, and look at the eye as an eye doctor rather than as a refracting optician. And those are the people that also, as I mentioned with Frank Gibson, could get anybody to go anywhere. You know, you're going to drive an hour and a half to, uh, to Omni because they're the best and that's what I believe in. And nowadays we're sort of talking, I mean, we're nice people and so we don't want to push people the wrong way, Ted. So we'll say, and you've seen this in a smaller town. You you send people when you need to send them to a big city. You send them. Yeah. But well, uh, you could go to uh, to uh, Savannah where this specialist is, but um, it's kind of far. And uh, well, what about locally here in Tifton? Well, is you know Doctor Butcher up the street? Yeah, I guess you could go see him. I mean, we have to continue to practice the power of the pen and the power of the referral and don't give people multiple choice. Tell them where they need to go. You know, what if you or I went to a, God forbid, I had to go to a cardiologist and he's sending us for a procedure and he gave us a list of five names. I mean, so we're we're making this incredible progress from the early diagnostic days to today and yet we're going backwards in incredible leaps and bounds at times by not uh, steering people, by not educating people, for example, before cataract surgery on premium lenses, et cetera, et cetera. You, you know, because you live it every day, you've got a thriving private practice with an associate and you know that um, we, if we don't stay up, there are going to be other people to take our place. If we don't stay up with the times, there are going to be nurse practitioners and PAs that are going to want to treat glaucoma and that are training to treat glaucoma as we speak. So, um, so 
so proud of where we've come. I just, I'm not settled yet. I'm not, I want to be settled in that we're going to, we're going to use everything we have and, and build on that. Well, I think that's one of the things too, that is one of your superpowers is the belief in fighting for that patient, that guest, that customer, whatever you want to call them. While at the same time, having this almost underdog mentality, um, sort of, you know, that we're, we've been a profession that has come from small beginnings to where we are now. And because of that, we've got so much to show and so much to give, but this, the thing that I think probably I got most out of being in the army was just a lot of confidence. And that's what probably I, I left with more confidence than I came in way more. Like I, let, I didn't have hardly any when I came in, but I left feeling very confident about the way I was treating my guests, uh, taking care of them, making sure I was keeping them in the forefront of what was most important, not just making sure I was doing something that was going to help my wallet because all that other stuff happens because of doing all the right things. And that was the lesson that I think I and thousands of other externs have learned from you in the Omni. And uh, that's, that's a great gift. Well, you're very kind. It's just not a pleasant feeling to always be wondering what would ophthalmology do or what's in that black box of mystery, you know, answers to eye problems that only ophthalmologists have the key to. And that was symbolic when in optometry school, Dr. Eisenberg had the key around his neck and he'd open up the cabinet with the diagnostics. I mean, a lot of ODs that haven't received the kind of training that, that you and I have been lucky to receive are always second guessing themselves from red eyes to retina to, to optic nerve. And we're also buying into the technology, in my opinion, a little bit too much. I mean, I love OCT, but when my students come out of a room and say, I said, what do you want to do? Well, the vision's 2025. Okay. What would you like to do? Uh, get an OCT. How about looking at the eye first? How about dilating and looking at the eye? Um, and you know, you know, one of my big bugaboos, I've written articles about it, um, relates to just doing the complete exam and not cutting corners, doing the same exam on everybody every time. And when you do that, there's just nothing we're going to miss. And it just builds on itself. But if you start skipping around and you rely on like a case we saw last week sent for cataract surgery, and probably the last three or four visits by different doctors, 0 0.3, 0 0.3, 0 0.3 cups, no dilation, no dilation, optos, optos. I know optos has its place. Trust me, I'm not here to bash it, but it doesn't give you a stereo view of the optic nerve when you dilate and you look with your handheld lens. Ted, these discs were 0 0.9. They were not 0 0.3. Right. And the pressure was 15. And it's moments like that that make me sort of go back 40 years and say, have we made progress? Are we, each one of us as individuals, are we doing the things we need to do to make sure we don't miss anything with our patients? And that starts with the basic um, exam with all its components, no matter whether the patient comes in in pain or talking about a red eye. I mean, they could have a brain tumor and something else. A lot of people have two or three or five things at the same time, even though they only are coming in for one thing. So to stay up on uh, on things is amazing. And, and that's why I love still having externs and residents because they keep me on my toes. Uh, yesterday, they brought me into a room and said, this woman's got a red eye. And we're not sure why. So we started going through her medical history. And I remembered a lecture that, uh, as the woman said, yeah, I'm getting some injections for eczema. And I'm thinking, you know, we're seeing way too many of these ads on TV for drugs. Right. And the Dupixent uh, jingle comes into my head. And I said, is it Dupixent? She says, yeah, that's the one. And Caroline Pate, who's one of our stars on the C committee, runs the Allied Health Program, uh, UAB faculty. I sat in on a fifth district lecture where she introduced me to that. And so 
I can get a little lazy with keeping up with these new meds and ocular conditions and reading journals, you know, as the stack of journals, you know, gets up to the two oh, yeah. foot level. Um, and this woman has a dupixent red eye and the residents are going to write it up. And we had a great time taking pictures and, you know, sharing that case. So there's so many new things. We just started cross-linking yesterday, which I thought, well, I'll retire before I have to deal with that. But it was fun. And uh, it wasn't fun for the patient. But it was fun <laughs> for us watching. So there's just so many things every day that we can look forward to. Uh, but it involves practicing to the full extent of our license. So if if you could, you personally could jump in the Wayback Machine and go back and talk to 1984 Paul on the day before you started your first day at Omni, what would be the advice you would give 1984 Paul? Um, it took me a while to get involved legislatively. I was pretty obsessed with the practice and I didn't get involved in the nineties. So I'd probably tell Paul back then, uh, get involved legislatively now. Um, I probably would have told 1984 Paul, to be honest with you that, um, Paul, I know you're, um, a zealot about the profession, but don't scare your students like I did Ted. <laughs> And it's only by the grace of God that you still talk to me. <laughs> oh, no. And there are other ways to teach there. And I'm just kind of, uh, you know, really, you saw that on the in the mid stroma, except it's on the endothelium. You know, go back yeah. and take a look. And I, I've mellowed over the years. But so I'd probably tell Paul to change his teaching style a little bit. I'd probably. um I don't know that I'd do much else. I've been involved in um, in a lot of different aspects of the profession. We talked about SECO. The American Board of Optometry was another amazing experience when Kevin Alexander and Randy Brooks said, uh, what do you think about board certification? I said, I think it's great. Every other profession has it, and we don't. And they said, well, how would you like to start it? And this was after the House of Delegates said that fairly narrow vote and became very controversial. Um, it was not a pleasant time politically in my life because I was attacked by a lot of anti-board uh, certification people within our profession. And as a matter of fact, as we started it and developed the first exam, uh, you know, we were sued by our own profession, yeah. by the American Optometric Society. And that took you know, two years of our lives and $2 million and three weeks at a time in uh, Los Angeles uh, District Court. And uh, luckily that was thrown out and I'm still very proud of it. I'm sad that only, you know, three to 4,000 people have participated in it. Everybody wants to be board certified, as you know, Ted, if you Google board certified optometrist. Every optometrist in Florida will come up because they're allowed to say that. But most optometrists around the country, it will say in their bio on their website, you know, Dr. Smith is certified by the board mm -hmm. uh, in glaucoma and in therapeutics. So that's very different. That's called licensed. And uh, so I continue to enjoy maintaining my certification with ABO um, and and I encourage other people to do the same. They've made it, you know, a lot easier. You don't have to take a test every 10 years. You take little modules along the way. And when I say that I'm board certified, I know that it's attached to an activity every few months that relates to lifelong learning and that yeah. I can prove to my patients that I'm not just sitting around staring at that two foot tall stack of magazines that are still in the poly bags that, that I'm not reading. As a matter of fact, I have a neuro module due uh, in the next month or two. So uh, that was one of those things that uh, if I was talking to 1984 Paul, I might have said, might have just warned him and said, you're going to be disappointed sometimes with your own colleagues and how um, 
I hate to use the word hateful, but they were. They can be, but try to put all that noise behind you and don't look at social media, which took me too long to realize I need to not look at and just do what you think are the right things. That's great. Well, Paul, uh, this has been a load of fun, and I've had a blast. And I, I really can't thank you enough for doing this because this means so much to me. And I know our audience got a ton out of this, so thank you so much. Ted, thank you. It was indeed a pleasure and honor. And to the listeners that sat through it, um, I'm grateful to you as well. Thank you. God bless. Thanks, Paul. I got one other topic I want to cover with you and that's bourbon. Yes. Uh, now we're talking. Yeah. Now we're talking. Now we're talking. So, uh, what's a really interesting bourbon you've had recently? Well, um, right across the hall from my office where I'm speaking to you is a gentleman named Craig Hethcox who deserves a lot of credit in optometry and you know, Craig, well, Craig very well. he was, the first to tie bourbon and VEF history. When the VEF was floundering a little bit, we were looking for a venture capital partner, and we found a group with some money called Omni Health Services, and they ran small bed hospitals from Dadeville, Alabama, up to Cumming, Georgia. And Craig was one of the principals in that company. And Craig was instrumental in not only supporting us uh, leaving the VEF and starting what was called Omni Eye Services in April of 84. And then Bill Wallace joined him in opening those 14 other centers. And I, I started run, you know, just concentrating on running Omni Atlanta. But then he was instrumental in opening the other 13 centers and those had a, their own interesting course related to one company buying the next, buying the next. And we're still owned corporately by a company called Surgery Partners, but they leave us to do our thing. And so Craig's been a lifelong friend and loves optometry as much, if not more than many optometrists. So he's the one that introduced me to bourbon and uh, he's... He is uh, a connoisseur. Um, he unfortunately has gotten me to be a connoisseur. <laughs> and just recently he brought this um, bourbon. You know, we all know the Heaven Hill products. And the, yeah. I spent, you know, all kinds of time over at, um, over Christmas trying to find Eagle Rare and, you know, some of the ones that you can't find. But he introduced me to Balconis, I think is how you pronounce yeah. it. It's yeah. a, Texas pot still right. bourbon, and they've got a um, kind of a a malt um, blend. So it's a bourbon that is you know pushing towards the scotch side. Yeah, yeah. and I, I've never really tried much scotch. Uh, I just see the Macallan in the uh, cabinet at Total Wine for thirty nine ninety nine, meaning three thousand nine hundred ninety nine dollars. <laughs> So I've tried a little Glenlivet, but I, I continue to like bourbon, and I've started to make Sazeracs because of our trip Seco in New Orleans, New Orleans last year, and we're going again, we hope, next year, that Sazeracs and Old Fashions are kind of fun to play around with, with bitters and all of that. But uh, my wife, I think, totally thinks I'm an alcoholic. She knows I'm not because I hardly touch the stuff, but if you look at my bar in the basement, there's many bottles and it's just, you know, I'm a collector. I'm not a drinker. Yeah. <laughs> Let's I know leave what you it mean. at that. Yeah. I, w <laughs> I probably won't need to tell you then about this uh, website called Flavair uh, that might become a really big passion for you if you're not careful. But uh, uh -oh. Kristen, Kristen bought me a subscription for the, for the year and you get these little tastings. I mean, it's really not much at all, but there's different, three different uh, tastings you get every quarter but you also can get a, a full bottle of something. And there was a company called Barrel Craft, and they had a, a malted whiskey, just like you were talking about earlier, quite nice, very good. Right. 
but they also have this thing called the vault that once a month on, I think it's the last Thursday of the month, they open up the vault and you can order one bottle of all sorts of things. They've got everything from just um, sort of more run of the mill kind of uh, bourbons, all the way up to Pappy 25 or 2023 20, that you can oh. get for $10,000 or something like that. Um, but I actually, this last time when they opened it up, I got a bottle of Blanton's and, uh, I also got a bottle of Weller antique 107. Oh yeah. Craig talks about that. I've never had it. It's, I actually got it. I, I only got it for 140 bucks. Uh, it wasn't wow. you know, a terribly expensive bottle. Um, it's going to be a spec. We, Kristen and I cracked it open last night just to have a nice little taste. Apparently it's got the exact same mash bill as does, uh, old rip van winkle and also pappy pappy 10 um it has the same um proof rating as pappy 10 which is 107 but wow. you know instead of spending 1200 dollars, i spent 140 and very nice uh, you know, so it was we'll see uh how that holds up if it lasts very long but that's what's over here behind my I see it i see yeah, it yeah. bourbon is sort of like the vaccine these days because you can't get a particular type you want it even more right <laughs> i know it i know it 